name is Dr. Liz Burton Crow. I'm the Director of Education for the Carrillo Center for Nonviolence. Welcome back to Living One, a free monthly webinar series where presenters from around the world share their vision about psychology, life, and culture in the absence of animal exploitation. Through Living One, we attempt to answer the question, we know what's wrong, but what does right look like? This month, we welcome Stephen Harnad. Born in Budapest, Hungary, Harnad is a professor of psychology at the University of Quebec in Montreal, an adjunct professor of cognitive science at McGill University, and emeritus professor of cognitive science at the University of Southampton. Harnad was the founder of Behavioral and Brain Sciences, of which he remained editor-in-chief until 2002. Currently, he is editor-in-chief of the refereed journal Animal Sentience, launched in 2015 by the Institute of Science and Policy of the Humane Society of the United States. A vegan, Harnad is active in animal welfare, animal rights, and animal law. So without further ado, interviewing Stephen today will be our very own Dr. Gabe Bradshaw. Well, welcome everyone and welcome Stephen. <clears throat> um, this is really a wonderful occasion. Everything seems very poignant these days and it's hard to know where exactly to begin, but we'll uh, try to begin at some sort of beginning. Stephen, could you give a little bit of your uh, background arc of um, your engagement and involvement in uh, animal rights and, and, anim and the cessation of animal exploitation? Okay. Kind of the arc of, of your own experience and some insights and reflections that you have gathered along the way. Okay, sure. Um, I, at the, when we had a lunch uh, at, uh, I think it was at uh, Miss Snowden in Montreal with my woodwind quintet when I was in high school, I played horn. And the rest of us were, were high school age, but the oboist was older. He was uh, in his 20s, a, a, a doctor, actually, a dermatologist. We were sitting around, and I was eating a turkey club sandwich, I remember. And he um, said that uh, he had been a vegetarian. And I said, how could, I mean, this was a long time ago. I said, how could you do that, your, your health? And he said, no, actually, I, I think it's fine for your health. It may even be a little bit better for you, but, um, and I was shocked, and I said, well, okay, if that's true, then why, why did you stop? He said, well, I, I went into the Navy, and uh, we went o o overseas, or, or onto the oceans, and all we had to eat was salt pork, so I had to eat that, or I had nothing to eat, and then I never went back to it. Well, it was three weeks before my 17th birthday, and I decided that I was going to try it. I didn't think I would succeed. I was going to try it, and I did, and it was ridiculously easy, as those of you who are vegetarians or vegans know, it was ridiculously easy, but, and this I'm deeply ashamed about, I didn't become an activist, I just stopped eating meat, right, that was my, not only did I stop eating meat, uh, but I, if we were at a, for years and years, if we were at a, at a table and somebody said, oh, you're a vegetarian, does it bother you if I eat meat? I said, no, uh, go ahead. It's, it's vive la liberté, you know, uh, freedom for everybody. Uh, and all of this is, to me, un understandable now. I don't understand. I'm sure I was, it was immature for, for my age, but I can't believe that all those years I was as passive about it as that. And then, many years later, in fact, 10 years ago, I was across the street over there at the uh, Faculty of Law at McGill, and there was a, Alana Devine had a, um, had a, a, a workshop or a seminar or something uh, for, uh, on animal law. And there were um, three main speakers. Alana Devine talked about the the problem of, of uh, puppy mills in Quebec and the and uh, the awful things that happen to uh, to the sort of uh, industrially produced pet uh, market. And then there was somebody from Switzerland who's actually quite well known, a a lawyer who was talking about the laws that they. Alana Devine was a lawyer as well. Uh, a, a, the laws in Switzerland, 
uh, for, for protecting animals, and that was interesting. And then the last one came, and he was the one I was the least interested in. He was a law professor who had uh, said, been, been working on something to do with the dairy industry. And he started his talk by saying, you know, we all agree, I mean, we, we care about living beings and about sentience. We all, we all, we all agree about the abuses that uh, Alana Devine was talking about for puppy mills and, and pets. And we all admire what Switzerland is beginning to do. But let me just speak to the vegetarians in the audience. If you imagine that in declining to eat meat, you're abstaining from the horrors, abstaining from contributing to the horrors, you're wrong. In fact, you're still party to the worst of the worst. And then he told me what essentially, if I put my hand on my heart, I could have guessed it. I said, of course, what's happening with those veal? And what kind of state with those calves? And what kind of a state is the mother cow? And, and, what, and, the, and what happens to all of the males? And how do they kill them anyway? All that stuff. It all welled up. And in 15 seconds, really 15 seconds, after he, he finished that preamble, I became a vegan. I, do, I wasn't eating anything at, the, at the, anything at the time, so I can't say that the event was not eating. I wasn't eating. But from then on, there, and not only did I become a vegan, but I became a, an activist. And I realized that I should have been all along. How could I have edited behavioral and brain sciences? Yes, I cared about animals and in behavioral and brain sciences, I did not publish any primary research that involved animals, herding animals. But, um, but there was lots of re research reported secondarily on the brain and so on that did. I don't focus actually in my activism, I don't focus on animal research primarily because I think that the monster on the horizon is what we do in industrial farming or any kind of, of animal industry. And that, um, that the research question is deeper and more complicated. I, as a researcher, and I don't do research on animals, I can say that Oh, um, I'm in cognitive science, so I would say that like everyone else, whether they're in physics or chemistry or cognitive science or etc., most of the research that we do is inconsequential. It doesn't help anybody on the planet ever, not just biomedical research, but any kind. A lot of it has to do with uh, getting grants. A lot of it has to do with careerism, getting tenure, etc., etc. The small proportion of any research that does anyone any good, and, there's, and probably the proportion in biomedical research is higher, is still extremely minoritarian. So it's, a, it's just a small part of it. And I don't want to stake my activism on that for the simple reason, not simple, for the complicated reason, that most of the ills that we do to animals, both by industrial farming and by territory encroachment and, and hunting and, and fur and fun and all the other stuff that we do with them. Most of that is completely, but completely unnecessary, both for our health and for our survival. The difference with this small fraction of biomedical research is that some of it is saving lives. I don't know what the final verdict on that will be, but I know that this is not the time to talk about it while we're, do, while we're killing so many animals so cruelly for no reason. We should not be immediately rushing to a, a laboratory research as the, the abomination. Much of it is, but, it, but the, the real abomination is outside the laboratory. So I became an activist. I, I, uh, I got involved in things like, um, I'm, I'm uh, trying to put an end of the, uh, to the rodeo here in Quebec in, in 2015, around the same time it was happening all over the world, there was a movement in some countries to change the law so that animals would no longer be non-human animals. Here we've come to, to, to call them animal beings, but I, I don't always remember to say animal beings. When I'm talking about animals, I'm talking about non-human animals. Um, to stop 
considering non-human animals as just objects, as just property, that they're, that they're sentient beings with, bi with biological imperatives that have to be met. The law changed, but it was just words. So in 2015, they changed the law. And be because of the new law, I, I, I was interacting with some act animal activist lawyers and veterinarians. And we thought the first thing to challenge under this new law would be the rodeo. Because, well, if you know what a rodeo is, you, you know why. And so I'm involved in that. We're also involved in... You know, there's a, you probably know that there's a big split in the, in the, in the, in the animal activist community between so-called abolitionists and so-called welfareists. The welfareists sort of take the status quo, allegedly take the status quo as it is and just try to make it a little less worse for the animals. And the abolitionists uh, want to put an end to all of it. Well, I'm both, and I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I want to put an end to all of it. But I know that I'm not going to do it for, be able to do it from one day to the other. I gave already a hint of it that I, there's no point attacking um, medical, biomedical research when the immediate res response will be, but, but, but I have a, a relative in hospital, and if it weren't for that, they would be dying or something like that. That's, that has to be contended with, but it's too early. While, in reality, countless sentient beings are dying completely needlessly just to satisfy our taste, our pocketbooks, our entertainment desires, our travel desires, our property and territory desires, and what have you. I think, um, I think that's just about enough. The only thing I should add is that in behavior, behavioral and brain sciences had a special feature, and still has, that was what made it uh, as influential as it was, which is that articles that were accepted only under the condition that um, if they were accepted, they could be circulated to specialists around the world who could write 1,000 word commentaries uh, criticizing or elaborating or, or, or supplementing or, or analyzing, or, uh, etc., what was in the target article. And that's what made the journal so influential. So when in 2015, Andrew Rowan from the, uh, from the um, Humane Society International and that, the institute that uh, Liz mentioned uh, said, called me and said, he had been a behavioral and brain sciences associate when he called me and said he'd like to start a, a journal on animal sentience. I, I, I had vowed I was never going to be an editor of a journal ever again, but I immediately said yes, just as quickly as I became a vegan. I said, of course, this for yes. And uh, so I'm doing that too. And there are other, uh, lots of other activist activities that I'm indirectly or directly involved in. We can talk of those, about those if Gay has questions. But you asked uh, me to try to imagine how the world should be, or uh, if everything were all right. I mean, this is, you know, that uh, religious believers are always asking that kind of question, uh, and it's fantasy, but. In a world, a sentient world, because we're talking about sentient biological organisms, that means they can feel. And if, if they feel, as Jeremy Bentham pointed out, they can suffer. A world in which the human species, one of these sentient beings, is no longer exploiting all the rest of them in ways that not the cruelest of Darwinian evolution has ever, has, has ever assailed them. What, the, what anthropogenic human-caused harm is so far eclipses any kind of Darwinian harm that you can't even talk about it. There, yeah, there have been, there've been extinctions and, and, and comets and things like that, but nothing compared to the systematic, deliberate, knowing horrors that we it, it impose on animals. And in, in the world that I imagine, that comes to an end. There's no need for it. If it, were, if it were really a Darwinian struggle and we were doing it in order to survive, it would be another story. It would be a little bit more like the medical subset that I told you about, but it's nothing like that. We don't need to do it. We don't need to eat it. There's no big deal about becoming a vegan. It's ridiculously easy. And uh, it's also, I mean, I, I'm a university professor. I, 
I, I, and I'm single, so, so I make more money than I need. I'm not rich. But whatever I have that I don't need, I use for this. And we should all be doing that. That's the world. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I have a couple questions, many questions that come up. One is, do you see in your own experience um, that the that being a researcher or a professor and a quote unquote activists are really one and the same? Is is that the role that um, you think that academia needs to play? I was timid at first. In fact, uh, 10 years ago when I first became a vegan, I didn't let on. <clears throat> and very slowly, I, I give a course at McGill and I give a, and a course at UQAM as well. Very slowly, I became less timid. And now my answer is closer to, to yes. If you have moral ethical convictions and you're a professor you can't divorce them from from your professing and so whereas in the beginning i made a few hints of, about this now i have a course that's called um communication uh categorization communication and consciousness categorization is a very general area of cognitive science that i work on and do research on communication is language and every kind of communication human and non-human and consciousness, well, you know what that is. It's the same thing as sentience. It's the fact that conscious creatures feel. Uh, gradually, the course evolved into one where it was all headed. Now it's headed, like for the last week, when, it, when, we, when I discuss what really matters and what life is really about and for. And it's what I just said. It's to, it's to put an end to the suffering that we're causing in other sentient creatures, human and non-human. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it seems to me that those, the, 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 this sounds arcane, but I think it, I think it still is something that's a, uh, a sore point and an issue or a point of conflict or confusion between quote unquote, being an objective researcher and an activist or academic and an activist is that essentially when in academia, at least this was my experience, um, that we seek the truth and to have honesty and that the protocols for, so I'm just going to say science, I'm using that as kind of an umbrella term for scholarship, um, or maybe I should use one or the other in this broader scholarship. Scholarship um, uh, seeks to uh, unflinchingly um, uncover the truth, quote unquote truth. In other words, not to hide, not distort, etc. And these are the protocols of objectivity. And <clears throat> that kind of, that's an honesty. And um, is an activism uh, that form? So in other words, that really being an academic and a researcher and an activist is really one and the same in spirit? Well, I, I've never put it that way, but I, I, I can't see any objection to that. What I'd say is there's no conflict between, between seeking the truth and and. and putting an end to harm, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Moral, there's no conflict between the two. The, the mm -hmm. truth doesn't entail, entail the morality. Philosophers are always telling us that is doesn't in, entail ought and blah, blah, blah. But um, there is something to, it's true that science and scholarship pursues the truth, but just like gastronomy, you know, the, people have different tastes in what aspects of the truth they're in, they pursue. You know, some people go into fields that, that are not going to, do any good. Uh, my brother happens to be a mathematical physicist, uh, a good one, but, uh, but I, I myself couldn't possibly, if I had that kind of uh, inclination, I couldn't possibly endorse spending my life on that when there's so much suffering going on. So no conflict between truth and morality, but there is a conflict between taste and morality mm -hmm. in the case of eating as well as what you do with the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me just <clears throat> then circle back to, you know, you're talking about the, the medical, biomedical research and, and those fields relative to the uh, magnitude of um, abuse and exploitation and torture of animals en masse in, in farming, you know, and, and outside the lab, we'll call it that. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> is 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 sort of the far you know pressing kinds of issues. However, in, in 
science, and I'm going to use science specifically, science specifically um, uh, and scholarship is the epistemic authority, and science in particular is the epistemic authority for what society and policymakers look to inform, you know. And uh, there, there is a body of, of knowledge and information which is generated from the abuse and torture of animals that's the animal models in the sciences and biomedical sciences and uh, that has been you know there's an understanding and it's functional that those animals there's a knowledge that they are sentient that they have the same capacities relative to the standard model of a unitary model of brain, mind, and behavior and consciousness, which is why they're used as animal models in lieu of humans. So that right there, and the fact is, you know, that what we know about humans can be applied to animals and vice versa. That model is really core to the biomedical and neurosciences. And yet those individuals who participate in those kinds of experiments um, admit to those, but then linguistically parse and ethically parse um, animal beings, as you call them, animal beings from humans. So to me, I guess I would, I would sort of counter in the sense of, um, yes, like, for example, for me, antibiotics, I go for them. <laughs> and I know their history, you know. Um, and if my beloved is dying and sick, you know, whether they're of any, any species, um, I am hard-pressed to not reach for the bottle or whatever the cure is within certain, with certain, certain parameters. But that's a huge thing. In other words, that continues. And to me there is an intrinsic lie within the biomedical scientists and among the scientific community that get grants that support these universities that perpetuate um, the, the illusion of differences at the level of what we're talking. Um, and so to me, I see that as a very serious kind of um, issue. Um. You lost me a little bit. I'll try to retrace what you said. Remember, I started out by saying my first priority is not biomedical research because there's so many other horrors going on. You went straight for the first priority for the, for, for the biomedical research, but that's okay. We can, we can talk about that if you like. What is this lie that you're referring to? I mean, it's not, it has nothing to, uh, biomedical research is not, um, among, among scientific uh, research, it's not the, the most rigorous pursuit of truth. I would say perhaps my brother's field of mathematical physicist is more rigorous in terms of logic and empirical uh, evidence, but it's, a, it's, it's empirical, just like, like uh, the other empirical sciences. And um, it does save lives, some of it, a small part of it. I don't know what the lie is over there. You can't say that it does, it's a lie that it saves lives. It does save lives. What's all, what, what the lie is to say that, that much of it is life-saving. Much of it is career and, 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 uh, and, uh, and, and grants and citations and things like that. Some of it saves lives. And that has to be faced. But how can it be faced by a planet that is doing even more horrible things to countlessly more animals, not to save lives, but just for taste or for fun or for uh, entertainment or habit or territory in order to have more. So, so I, I don't know why you would want to focus on the tragically hard case where there's really a conflict of life and death interest between an experimental animal and a human be a non-human animal and a human being. That's, that's a huge and perhaps the most profound uh, moral dilemma there is. And yet there's so much, or there's so much, awful stuff going on, most of the awful stuff, that is not a dilemma. It's straightforward. So I don't know why we go to the dilemma, but I will. Animal models, for example, are being attacked as, as, as not being... Uh, um, so by Vegans often attack them, um, saying they're not really animal models. You, when, you, when you test something on, a, on an animal, it doesn't 
necessarily generalize to humans. What they usually have in mind is clinical trials and stuff like that, which is right. really a, a, a narrow, an even narrower subset of biomedical research because it's basic biomedical research that also saves lives. And it's not about animal models. It's really about bio, often it's about biochemistry and physiology. And, and you can't do the biochemistry and physiology on people, so you do it on non-human organisms that are not animal models for disease. They're simply being used to do research. Most of that research is like my brother's, just blue skies research. Some of it really is, and sometimes it's hard to say which. Some of it really is, has, or will save lives. We can talk about that directly if you want, but let's not conflate it with the big picture, because it isn't the big picture. Well, I guess, you know, it, it, to me that there's a continuum, as uh, to me, for example, um, that, that there's not much difference between a cat, a mouse, and a pig, um, or a cow. And in the sense of their, we'll look from a conventional scientific perspective in the, ten, in the conventional way of their capacities to feel, think, um, have aspirations, dreams, you know, everything that, that we cherish and that we regard for ourselves. Uh, and so, um, although the numbers may be less within the um, biomed, I'll just call it biomedical or, you know, the scientific research realm uh, than say the, the, the farming and the exploitation outside of the research domain. Um, nonetheless, they are suffering uh, tremendously and being abused yeah. for the purpose yeah. You're of, absolutely of right. humans. Of, You're of absolutely, human there's no, there's benefit. no disagreement. There's no Sorry? disagreement. You're absolutely yeah. right. But what's the point? Well, I guess the no, no no point. I'm just saying is that you know you you were saying it was minor and relative to what was going on on the exterior for the say I'll say farmed animals exploitation rodeos and things like that. So m maybe my question is 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 it really mainly that the 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 concern is numbers? No. In other words, that the it's numbers are, are suffering more out in the outer area. No, that's not the primary concern. It's a big concern, of course. Numbers do matter. Uh, and the degree of agony matters as well. But no, the thing is literally the fact that the stuff that's happening outside the lab is not to save lives. And the stuff that happens in the lab is to save lives. And if you focus on the, on the on a, um, sort of um, putting an end now to the life-saving biomedical research, you are inviting from the people that are trying to stop the bigger horrors outside, you're inviting the response of the consumers to say, look, I'm not going to stop eating meat. You're asking me to let my relatives die. I don't want that. I don't want to invoke, needlessly evoke that. Uh, but, okay, so then within that argument, though, is that um, what you're saying is that the sacrifice of these animals, um, which which are quite numerous when you think of the mice and uh, the planaria and cats and et cetera, um, that that use of them and that objectification and their suffering is um, worthwhile relative to saving human lives. So they're uh, no, you're believing no, that? I'm not saying that. I'm against that. I'm an abolitionist. I'm simply not taking that on now because it's going to harm the case against the, mm -hmm. the bigger, the bigger uh, agony. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying the smaller agony is justified just because it saves lives. I'm saying it's a tragic dilemma that has to be faced. But it's, it's, it, 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 uh, uh, it, in it's in opposition to the argument for doing the for for ceasing to do the unnecessary um, damage. Yeah, see, I disagree just from my own personal experience. Of course, you have much vaster experience with the neuroscience and bio, whatever. But um, that uh, 
neuroscientists that I know, well-standing, um, have agreed that there is a unitary model of brain, mind, and behavior and consciousness. And they do their experiments, they do their studies based on that. Largely, it's, it's funded for making inference to, to humans. And yet, when it comes out publicly, for example, the justification for using non-human primates or chimpanzees for biomedical purposes, um, the line is drawn. And that's what I call the lie, is that they function um, based on a science that allows this bi-directional inference, making inference from the animal to the human and the human backward. But when it comes down to actually specifically speaking out, they draw a line saying that humans are better and that the animals upon whom they're experimenting are less. And that to me is troublesome from the perspective of that science and scholarship is considered to be the epistemic authority of, of which law and policy and the public looks to um, as the truth. And so you're, you're, you're pro this promulgating um, something which, which is an untruth. And that, I believe, that's my personal belief, is uh, perpetuates the myth that animals, whether they're inside the lab or they're outside the lab, are less than in that way. I, you know, I, there's a lot you say that I don't disagree with. I mean, but, uh, but I'm an activist. I'm not interested in ideology or abstractions. I, you know, I'm interested in, in putting an end to the suffering. And yeah. it's the, 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 what you said about cognitive model, et cetera, so that's really, I, I won't even go into that because that's, that's oversimplified. Most of research is not the kind of research that, that uh, we used to do, we, not, that researchers used to do on primates. It's not, the, the, most of the neuroscience research is on cellular properties and, and some of it is on behavioral properties which, which involves, including work, research on pain, which involves deliberately hurting animals. It's horrible. Uh, they're not allowed to do it with, uh, with chimpanzees anymore. And so now they're starting here at, lab to, at, at McGill to instead produce a marmoset lab, which is another kind of a primate, and use them. It's, it's horrible. There's no question that it's horrible. But if you attack that, you're indirectly attacking cases where people are doing just as horrible uh, things without even being able to tell you the lie that is to save human lives. And that's why I want to stay away from it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, I think it, it's a good point that you make about, you know, cutting up the pie of, of, of rights, but I, I will, we, we can move on, but I do believe that, or maybe, maybe you can talk about what is the role of science as a scientist and a researcher these days? Um, yeah. You've had your own evolution, and we were talking about sort of the, um, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the hip, you know, the, almost the Hippocratic Oath and, you know, getting a PhD and, you know, always following the protocol of truth and, and, and things like that. Now, I'll just tell you my personal experience, for example, of what I've written, which brings into the neuroscientist and all I do is collect it. I'm not a pundit. I just collect what's there and put the pieces together and they are peer reviewed and they are accepted by neuroscientists and neuropsychologists. And a lot of the implications um, are, are for non-human animals, which usually fall under the purview of wildlife biology, conservation, um, you know, veterinary medicine and ethology and zoology. And that uh, there's a real line drawn. So the, in the X, they ignore it because neuroscience is not their education, it's nor their, not their proclivity. And I do see that within the academic, that there's a schism there, a problem in terms of who has authority to speak. And from my perspective, people who are doing work in neurosciences and biomedical have this understanding of this unitary model of the sameness, variations on the theme, 
Um, and they could do tremendous amount by being open about that and being forthright about that, could have tremendous amount of impact in terms of influencing how um, policy and law uh, is shaped uh, for farmed animals, for wildlife, for the animals who are exploited for entertainment. Well, to, to a certain extent, I agree with you. It would be nice if the neuroscientists and the behavioral scientists that know about species uh, uh, capacities and things like that applied it in order to, uh, to spare them the suffering. Uh, most of them that don't know it and most of them don't care. And they're not authorities. I mean, you can, you can, if you have a factual question to ask them, you can ask them. You can say, what is the threshold for, for um, say, um, electrical stimulation pain for a given species, and you'll get a number. There are authorities on that. And, and you, know, you know the most, the most uh, notorious numbers, like the L, notorious LD50 for, for rodents, how, many, how much of the, any substance you have to give them before half of them die. Mm -hmm. They'll give you numbers like that. But that doesn't make them authorities. Either no, but there are or, but there are individuals within neural sciences that um, are learned and synoptically, you know, have, have have a deeper understanding. And those individuals, if they speak to uh, openly about the capacities of animals, it would have a tremendous influence in terms of how law and policy and public opinion is shaped. Well, that's um, mainly the, infl the, uh, the ambition of animal sentience. What we want is to have the, ex the animal sentience is about what it feels like to be a member of a species. And, there, and the, you were emphasizing unitary stuff, but in fact, it's wildly different. There is one invariant thing though, uh, and that is the difference between sentient and insentient species. I'm not, I don't like the expression speciesist because as a vegan, I'm obliged to eat plants and that's a species. And if it's, I'm a speciesist for, spe for treating plants differently, um, that's not a pejorative. That's just, that's just trying to stay alive. So what the, the important feature of animals is not that they're all cognitively the same, they're not. Uh, they're very different. I mean, uh, uh, bats have sonar. We don't have sonar. That's really different. Um, uh, humans can talk and, and, and chimp chimpanzees cannot, and that's really different. But what a huge swath of living organisms has in common is that they're sentient. The thing that Jeremy Bentham pointed out was the most important thing. They're sentient, and if they're sentient, that means, which means that they can feel, then they can be hurt. And that's what, if, if, it were, if the dream were that scientists who know this should go out there and, and, and be authorities and tell everybody, that's sort of part of the dream of the journal as well. We want to point out what it is that different species can feel and what we're doing to them. Mm -hmm. And we want the scientists to also attest to what it is that they can feel and what they're doing to them. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about scientists, because the reason that that veterinarians and ethicists and lawyers are, are important is because we have to also, and, and even, even uh, politicians, is because we have to look at what is justified to do with them and what's not justified to do with them. I'm, I lean towards the fact that almost nothing is justified. Mm -hmm. Hervé, is that a turkey behind you? Me? Is it? <laughs> you have to put on your. You have to put. Yeah, it's a vulture. A, a vulture. But is is it yeah. real or is it is it really or is it an image? It's it's a real. I I make I took I took the picture in Gabon in uh, in fall. Oh, I see. There's still a picture. I can't tell from here whether it's not sitting there on your shoulder. So. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a picture. It's a picture. Very good. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so yes, uh, science, uh, we, we, I suppose I also, I also uh, want to benefit from scientists as authorities, authorities on the stuff that they're experts in. I don't consider neuroscientists to be experts on the consciousness because many of them don't even work on consciousness and those who do often don't know what they're talking about. But there are 
ethologists and comparative psychologists that have been studying different species intensively. I'm not interested, I'm interested, but I'm not, I don't want to collaborate just like with behavioral and brain sciences with anybody who's doing anything to harm them, including keep them in capti captivity. But some um, um, ethologists continue to study animals in their natural setting in the wild and they're experts on it and their expertise is relevant to the question of their status both as sentient, as sentient, which is the cr cr crucial thing. You know, the, the borderline for sentience used to be somewhere between, basically, people conceded that mammals were sentient. Uh, not, the, not the food industry. They, they're, they're saying the, poor, the pigs don't feel it. It's all just reflexes. But m most decent people concede that, as you said, dogs, pigs, uh, chickens, they're all sentient. But when it got to fish, people had doubts. So one of the big effects of the journal was uh, in the first year was to, was to bring that out in the open and show that among experts, and these really were world experts on fish, the near consensus is that fish are sentient and they suffer too. They suffer in a different way. We don't recognize their facial expressions, their sounds, etc. or at least we pretend not to, right? but they are. And now the frontier has moved further to invertebrates, right? We're already, we're already admitting it for, for octopuses, but the latest issue of uh, animal sentience is about insects. And by the way, insects begins to intersect with the, with the biomedical story, because if you push too far with sentience, not only are you going to say, you all have to become Janes and you have to wear masks and not step on anything, and your whole life has to be concerned with not uh, harming an insect, which would be an absurdity. It would be, it would, just like saying your relatives have to die, it would be an absurdity to say that you have to stop you have to your focus on not hurting insects, but it's true that insect, insects are sentient, and there are many implications of that without going to the to that extreme. And these we need experts for. We need experts to uh, to uh, to let us know what evidence there is for the fact that a species is sentient, and what it is that they feel, and what it is that their imperatives are, and what it is that denying them their imperatives or going against their imperatives does to them. But there are neuro um, comparative neuroanatomists who have stated very forthrightly uh, that birds and reptiles and mammals have the same same brain variations on the theme. In other words, yes, a bat may have sonar, and you know, uh, and I may be able to speak Danish, and you know, you speak French, and um, you know, the dog does one thing. But basically, there's a foundation which is more similar than different in that way. And, and that's that. That's foundational. That's a foundational. It's, you know, not, in within, doubt. it's hmm. not in doubt. I've already granted something much stronger than that. It's not. The, I'm not saying that all mammals. You don't need are, experts then to figure out whether that <laughs> an insect knows how to feel. They do. Um, and and I think that that's a. I think what I'd like to ask you is what do you see the evolving role and maybe transformation of um, academic research or what a researcher really is. We just taught a course on non-human nature methods, um, which really sort of borrowed from this trend of looking at decolonizing, um, decolonizing uh, scholarship and research from a Western colonial European thing, that's indigenous methodologies from indigenous people. And we brought that concept of decolonizing. What does a decolonized approach, in other words, an approach which is ethically and meaningful for that individual that we're studying, whether it's a whale or a sea turtle, a dog or a caterpillar. Um, and, and we had a course on, on that, um, understanding that then what do you see um, that the role of research and uh, education as we know it in academia, how do you envision that transforming with our deepening appreciation and willingness to, to accept animal sentience? Um, first of all, it's the differences that are interesting. Well, if you just say they're sentient all the way to any, any organism with a nervous system is sentient, that might be true. Uh, that's just the beginning. There, there are differences because they, can, they all feel, but what do they feel? What hurts? What doesn't hurt? What do they need? That's all stuff that comes from uh, science, and I hope not 
invasive science. I certainly would not want to go back if I misunderstand, unless I misunderstand you, I would not want to go in this decolonizing direction of treating animals the way that, um, that Aboriginal cultures treat them uh, at all. This, that's romanticizing by us and it's very actually it's colonial to imagine that, um, that if we just go back to the native, the original way of treating them and everything will be hunky-dory. It's not, it was awful. And there was a time in the history and the evolution of the human species when it was necessary for us to hunt and kill animals in order to survive. And it helped us, and it helped us get uh, bigger brains. For, but, but that's all over now. And it's not a question of going back to doing things that way. On the contrary, exactly the contrary. Mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to stop doing the things that those that started when it was necessary to harm animals, and that's still alive in, uh, still still uh, active in, in subsistence cultures. Subsistence cultures have to s subsist, so until we can get food to them some other way, they have to do what they do, but we shouldn't go back to trying to do it their way. Mm -hmm. uh, well, relatively speaking, I mean, a couple things is, relatively speaking, before colonization, just from a, let's just say, a biodiversity perspective, um, there was a dramatic change in biodiversity with the colonization. So when colonists came, say, to North America, there was a recess in terms of the numbers and diversity of species. And Aboriginal, we'll call it native, the native people, First Nation people live there. Now, and there's a tremendous amount of diversity. I'm not an expert in this. This is just sort of anecdotal in terms of my studies and all. But there's a tremendous amount of diversity in which indigenous, various indigenous tribes interacted. But relatively speaking, the problems that we see today did have genesis with the European colonization. Yeah, I agree. I, well, yes and no. The, uh, the anthropogenic, anthropogenic, Androgenic, anthropogenic harm that we caused to other species began before colonization and science or anything. It was a, humans were doing it. It's just humans doing it, and they're still doing it. But I agree with you that that basically territoriality and colonialism raised the scale enormously. But the solution is not to go back to doing things. On the contrary, what makes it possible for us now to be vegans? is the changes that occurred with, with agriculture. Not all of them good. I and mean, agriculture needs a lot of cleaning. I mean, plant ag agriculture needs a lot of, of um, benign re reform uh, transformation itself. But it does make it possible in principle to stop doing this, th these things to sentient animals. Of course, mm -hmm. sentient animals are also being harmed in order to do the agriculture. That's what encroachment is. So it's, a, it's complex and there's no simple uh, solution Certainly not going back to decolonizing is not the solution. It's so do you see, uh, I, I sort of interrupted you on that. Did, what do you see the evolving role of, um, of education and, and research in a university? Do you, do, do you see that that is changing dramatically? I don't know if it's changing. Or I, that I it like should it. be changing, or is that your vision of it's changing? Or? It made a huge change in the last few months it's now switched from from uh, live to online but other than that i don't know any i don't see any dramatic changes there i'm i'm heartened to see that more and more students care about non-human species more and more and, uh, and when i stopped being timid about it i a lot of my students <laughs> had, ended up becoming ve becoming vegan and i felt even more guilty i said i could have been converting vegans for decades if i hadn't been an idiot myself but anyway so so there's that but that's really local um, if you want me to dream, and I think the way, the, the way you said it, you said, how, how, how would you like it to be? Or, or, how, or, how, would, or how do you think it's going, how do I think it's going to be? I, uh, how do I think it's going to be is different from how I would like it to be. But even about how I think it's going to be, I um, have a choice, sort of like Pascal's wager, uh, to, uh, to assume that, that most people are rotten Trumpy, Trump supporters uh, but at, in their guts, and they always will be, um, or not, or to say no. There, there's a lot of them now, but 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 there's ways to get through to them. And I choose, but sort of by choice, I say it is possible by education and, and by evidence to uh, make people see the fact that the fact that there's no opposition between truth and 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 and, and what's right and wrong. 
Well, I probably should leave some time for some question and answers, although I could keep going on and on. <laughs> Did you want to say anything more about animal sentience in terms of um, letting people know about the journal? Uh, well, I could, tell you something, I could tell you something about sentience that I'm guarded about talking about. In, in, it's, sentience is a synonymous with consciousness. Uh, in cognitive science, where I am, there's two... There's two um, problems. One is called the easy problem and one is called the hard problem. Mm -hmm. The easy problem is figure, the neuroscientists are also working on the easy problem. Figure out what is going on inside the body or the head, if in the case of mammals, the head of, um, of uh, an organism that gives it the capacity to do, to do everything it can do. You know, uh, move around, recognize objects, uh, communicate, uh, uh, um, uh, learn, and in the case of uh, a uh, in the case of humans, speak and 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 etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. What is it in here? What's the mechanism that makes that possible? That's called the easy problem. We're not very far along on the easy problem, but let's dream that we've solved the easy problem. We can explain anything that uh, an org any organism can do. Uh, in, a, in, a, in an engineering sense, we can say, what is the causal mechanism inside it that gives it the capacity to do what it does? What's the hard problem? The hard problem is, let, let me repeat the easy problem in different words. The easy problem is how and why can organisms do all the things they can do? How and why? How requires a mechanism, and why requires a kind of an evolutionary explanation of what's it for, what's it doing for you. That's the easy problem. We're far from solving it. The hard problem is how and why do organisms feel? Feeling and doing is not the same thing. Feeling is consciousness, sentience. Sentient organisms feel, insentient organisms like plants grow, they have tropisms towards the sun, they have internal uh, um, chemi chemical process going on, but to the best of my knowledge and to the greatest of my hopes, they don't feel. It would be very bad news to hear that animals felt, uh, that plants felt, because it would be an another argument against veganism. They'd say, why are you telling me to stop eating pigs or dogs when plants feel? So let's all hope <laughs> that they don't. If they do in the end, then the bottom line is that um, we have, it's a conflict of vital interest. It's a little bit like biomedical research. We have to eat them or else we die. And you're not going to pass a policy that you have to die, okay? So um, the hard problem is how and why do organisms, feel, those who feel, feel? And the reason it's called hard, even though the easy problem is not solved either, is that it's not obvious at all what the adaptive advantage of sentience is. It's there, it evolved, there's no question, the brain generates it, nobody's, we, we don't have weird voodoo going on here, but it's extremely hard to say what it's for. You're tempted, all of you are tempted to say, oh, hey, hey, hang on a minute, if I didn't feel, and I, then I touched a stove, and it burnt me, I wouldn't even know that it was, I was, being, um, I was uh, being burnt, I wouldn't pull away my hand. Well, besides the fact that you pull away your hand before you feel it, well, but let's set, put that, that aside. That's a trick. The fact is that um, that's not an explanation. Well, I know that when, when you touch a stove, uh, it's damaging you, and the damage gets conveyed to, uh, to various, various places, including the, 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 the um, part that, that generates whatever it does, and we don't know the how, uh, the feeling of pain. But it's not obvious why you need the feeling of pain. I mean, in the end, you'll say, the reason I pull my hand off the stove when I feel it is because if I didn't feel it, I wouldn't pull my hand off the stove. But hang on a second. I mean, there's, there, it, it is possible to have causal mechanisms that do things, not just reflexes like pulling it off the stove, but learning and communicating, communicating and adapting, etc. You can do all of that without feeling. What, why do organisms feel? That's the hard problem. Whereas the journal that I, uh, is neither about the easy problem although we talk about it, nor, the, nor about the heart, definitely not about the heart problem. It's about the third one, which is the other minds problem, which is what do other organisms feel? Which organisms feel? Which ones are sentient? 
and what, what do they feel so that we know what to do and not do with them. That's my goodbye message. I mean, that's my, my closing message. The rest is for questions. I just have another coda, which is just, it, it, it was such a beautiful ending, but of course I'm going to spoil it. You made the comment about, um, and I just want to share this because this is important for other people. You said you were timid about telling people that you were vegan. Um, and, and did you, why were you timid and were there social implications and collegial implications that were challenging for you? A lot of people talk about this and I was curious for you. It's not quite, it's not quite that that I was, I, I didn't hide the fact that I'm a vegan, but I didn't pr pr proselytize for, I didn't try to convert my students to becoming vegan. I was, and the other thing, and now I'm, I'm going back to the years when I was just a vegetarian, I'm deeply ashamed that I used to say, you know, I, I'm all for freedom, you know. Now, if somebody says, do you mind if I eat meat? I say, I don't mind if you eat meat, but I assure you that the animal that you're eating mind it. Mm -hmm. That's the right answer. Let them, then let them work it out among themselves. And with students now, um, I, I say, look, I'm not, uh, I don't like charisma and, and hero worship, so I'm not interested in influencing you as me. I just want to tell you some objective things. These animals feel, and you're hurting them because you like the taste. Do you really want to be that kind of person? Mm -hmm. And then they can sort it out for themselves. Have you heard about the Liberation Pledge? No. It's, um, it, it was put out, I think, as by um, Direct Action. Um, I'll, I'll send you the link. And it has three components to it. One is that you are vegan. Um, and the second one is that you do not, you will not eat at the same table with someone who's not, who's someone who's consuming meat. And the third, I believe, is um, that you, you know, speak, you educate, you, you speak yeah. out. And that's, well, that's called the pledge. I do the first and the third. The second one I flirted with, I mean, in turn, it comes, out, it comes out of me that I say, I don't want to sit at the table. I don't want to go to a restaurant that does that. I don't want to deal with but um, it's in conflict with the third one. If you, if you, if you stay away from sit settings in which people eat meat, you have much less of a chance to, um, to uh, comment on it and to, and, to, and to try to influence them. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure, I mean, I understand. I can, I can be pulled yeah. in both ways. I, when I, you know, Peter Singer didn't start all of this. In the, in the, this will date me as well. I mean, I'm 75. <laughs> I'm 75 so, um, Peter Singer, when he went to Oxford, there was already a, an Oxford movement. It was, it was actually somebody from Canada, Stan, uh, Stanley and, uh, and Roz Godlevich from Canada and, and Roz and somebody else uh, were, wrote a book called Animals, Men and Morals. And their mm -hmm. opening to that book was, in this book, we do our best in order to describe, in order to describe uh, the truth about how much animals suffer and how, how eating them is not necessary for your health. If having read this, and if you have read the, this book and you don't have an argument, a logical argument against what we said, and you continue to eat animals, then um, you have reason to question whether you're, you're the kind of person that you believe you are. And I remember when I read that way, way back before I was an activist, I said, that's not a good strategy. I mean, you're, you think you're going to win people over with logic. It's not going to be logic. You have to get through to their hearts. That's why I put most of my um, b beliefs in, um, in uh, um, forcing the industry to uh, put... Uh, closed circuit TV into everything that they, they do, raising animals, transporting animals, slaughtering animals, and uh, diffuse it all, web, webcast it all the time in real time for people, ordinary citizens to see what is happening in real time. I really believe that that's the way to convert people, not by logic. And so I have, I have doubts sometimes about the educational approach, just as if some, somehow I, I could teach you um, that you must stop eating meat because of the following syllogism. A syllogism isn't going to win people over. It's their hearts. It's their own sentience. 
that you have to kind of awaken. Enough. I mean, we've promised to let people ask questions and we keep on not doing it. I know, that. and I keep, I keep adding them on. <laughs> I'm cheating. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you both. Um, what an interesting conversation. And of course, my wheels are turning. Um, before we turn off the recording and go to the q and I uh, just want to do a quick plug. I hope you all can join us next month. Uh, we have some exciting speakers lined up and we'll be meeting again on September 6th at the same time. Uh, so uh, thank you both very much.